Section 11 of State of the Union Addresses, 1849 to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Ernest. State of the Union Address, President Franklin Pierce, December 4, 1854, Part 1. Fellow citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, the past has been an eventful year, and will be hereafter referred to as a marked epoch in the history of the world. While we have been happily preserved from the calamities of war, our domestic prosperity has not been entirely uninterrupted. The crops in portions of the country have been nearly cut off. Disease has prevailed to a greater extent than usual, and the sacrifice of human life through casualties by sea and land is without parallel. But the pestilence has swept by, and restored salubrity invites the absent to their homes and the return of business to its ordinary channels. If the earth has rewarded the labor of the husbandman less bountifully than in preceding seasons, it has left him with abundance for domestic wants and a large surplus for exportation. In the present, therefore, as in the past, we find ample grounds for the reverent thankfulness to the God of grace and providence for his protecting care and merciful dealings with us as a people. Although our attention has been arrested by painful interest in passing events, yet our country feels no more than the slight vibrations of the convulsions which have shaken Europe. As individuals, we cannot repress sympathy with human suffering nor regret for the causes which produce it. As a nation, we are reminded that whatever interrupts the peace or checks the prosperity of any part of Christendom tends more or less to involve our own. The condition of states is not unlike that of individuals. They are mutually dependent upon each other. Amicable relations between them and reciprocal goodwill are essential for the promotion of whatever is desirable in their moral, social, and political condition. Hence, it has been my earnest endeavor to maintain peace and friendly intercourse with all nations. The wise theory of this government, so early adopted and steadily pursued, of avoiding all entangling alliances, has hitherto exempted it from many complications in which it would otherwise have become involved. Notwithstanding this, our clearly defined and well-sustained course of action, and our geographical position, so remote from Europe, Increasing disposition has been manifested by some of its governments to supervise and in certain respects to direct our foreign policy. In plans for adjusting the balance of power among themselves, they have assumed to take us into account and would constrain us to conform our conduct to their views. One or another of the powers of Europe has from time to time undertaken to enforce arbitrary regulations contrary in many respects to establish principles of international law. That law, the United States have in their foreign intercourse uniformly respected and observed, and they cannot recognize any such interpolations therein as the temporary interest of others may suggest. They do not admit that the sovereigns of one continent or of a particular community of states can legislate for all others. Leaving the transatlantic nations to adjust their political systems in the way they may think best for their common welfare, the independent powers of this continent may well assert the right to be exempt from all annoying interference on their part. Systemic abstinence from intimate political connection with distant foreign nations does not conflict with giving the widest range to our foreign commerce. This distinction, so clearly marked in history, seems to have been overlooked or disregarded by some leading foreign states. Our refusal to be brought within and subjected to their peculiar system has, I fear, created a jealous distrust of our conduct, and induced on their part occasional acts of disturbing effect upon our foreign relations. Our present attitude and past course give assurances, which should not be questioned, that our purposes are not aggressive nor threatening to the safety and welfare of other nations. Our military establishment in time of peace is adapted to maintain exterior defenses and to preserve order among the aboriginal tribes within the limits of the Union. Our naval force is intended only for the protection of our citizens abroad and of our commerce, diffused, as it is, over all the seas of the globe. The government of the United States, being essentially pacific in policy, 
stands prepared to repel invasion by the voluntary service of a patriotic people and provides no permanent means of foreign aggression. These considerations should allay all apprehension that we are disposed to encroach on the rights or endanger the security of other states. Some European powers have regarded with disquieting concern the territorial expansion of the United States. This rapid growth has resulted from the legitimate exercise of sovereign rights belonging alike to all nations, and by many liberally exercised. Under such circumstances, it could hardly have been expected that those among them, which have within a comparatively recent period subdued and absorbed ancient kingdoms, planted their standards on every continent, and now possess or claim the control of the islands of every ocean as their appropriate domain, would look with unfriendly sentiments upon the acquisitions of this country, in every instance honorably obtained, or would feel themselves justified in imputing our advancement to a spirit of aggression or to a passion for political predominance. Our foreign commerce has reached a magnitude and extent nearly equal to that of the first maritime power of the earth, and exceeding that of any other. Over this great interest, in which not only our merchants, but all classes of citizens, at least indirectly, are concerned, it is the duty of the executive and legislative branches of the government to exercise a careful supervision and adopt proper measures for its protection. The policy which I had in view in regard to this interest embraces its future as well as its present security. Long experience has shown that, in general, when the principal powers of Europe are engaged in war, the rights of neutral nations are endangered. This consideration led, in the progress of the War of Our Independence, to the formation of the celebrated Confederacy of Armed Neutrality, a primary object of which was to assert the doctrine that free ships make free goods, except in the case of articles contraband of war, a doctrine which, from the very commencement of our national being, has been a cherished idea of the statesmen of this country. At one period or another, every maritime power has by some solemn treaty stipulation recognized that principle, and it might have been hoped that it would come to be universally received and respected as a rule of international law. But the refusal of one power prevented this, and in the next great war which ensued, that of the French Revolution, it failed to be respected among the belligerent states of Europe. Notwithstanding this, the principle is generally admitted to be a sound and salutary one, so much so that at the commencement of the existing war in Europe, Great Britain and France announced their purpose to observe it for the present, not, however, as a recognized international fight, but as a mere concession for the time being. The cooperation, however, of these two powerful maritime nations in the interest of neutral rights appeared to me to afford an occasion inviting and justifying on the part of the United States a renewed effort to make the doctrine in question a principle of international law, by means of special conventions between the several powers of Europe and America. Accordingly, a proposition embracing not only the rule that free ships make free goods, except contraband articles, but also the less contested one that neutral property other than contraband, though on board enemy's ships, shall be exempt from confiscation, has been submitted by this government to those of Europe and America. Russia acted promptly in this matter, and a convention was concluded between that country and the United States, providing for the observance of the principles announced, not only as between themselves, but also as between them and all other nations which shall enter into like stipulations. None of the other powers have as yet taken final action on the subject. I am not aware, however, that any objection to the proposed stipulations has been made, but, on the contrary, they are acknowledged to be essential to the security of neutral commerce, and the only apparent obstacle to their general adoption is in the possibility that it may be encumbered by inadmissible conditions. The King of the Two Sicilies has expressed to our minister at Naples his readiness to concur in our proposition relative to neutral rights and to enter into a convention on that subject. The King of Prussia entirely approves of the project of a treaty to the same effect submitted to him, but proposes an additional article providing for the renunciation of privateering. Such an article, for most obvious reasons, is much desired by nations having naval establishments large in proportion to their foreign commerce. If it were adopted as an international rule, the commerce of a nation having comparatively a small naval force would be very much at the mercy of its enemy in case of war with a power of decided naval superiority. 
the bare statement of the condition in which the United States would be placed after having surrendered the right to resort to privateers in the event of war with a belligerent of naval supremacy will show that this government could never listen to such a proposition. The navy of the first maritime power in Europe is at least ten times as large as that of the United States. The foreign commerce of the two countries is nearly equal, and about equally exposed to hostile depredations. In war between that power and the United States, without resort on our part to our mercantile marine, the means of our enemy to inflict injury upon our commerce would be tenfold greater than ours to retaliate. We could not extricate our country from this unequal condition with such an enemy, unless we at once departed from our present peaceful policy and became a great naval power. Nor would this country be better situated in war with one of the secondary naval powers. Though the naval disparity would be less, the greater extent and more exposed condition of our widespread commerce would give any of them a like advantage over us. The proposition to enter into engagements to forego a resort to privateers in case this country should be forced into war with a great naval power is not entitled to more favorable consideration than would be a proposition to agree not to accept the services of volunteers for operations on land. When the honor or the rights of our country require it to assume a hostile attitude, it confidently relies upon the patriotism of its citizens, not ordinarily devoted to the military profession, to augment the Army and the Navy so as to make them fully adequate to the emergency which calls them into action. The proposal to surrender the right to employ privateers is professedly founded upon the principle that private property of unoffending noncombatants, though enemies, should be exempt from the ravages of war, but the proposed surrender goes but little way in carrying out that principle, which equally requires that such private property should not be seized or molested by national ships of war. Should the leading powers of Europe concur in proposing as a rule of international law to exempt private property upon the ocean from seizure by public armed cruisers as well as by privateers, the United States will readily meet them upon that broad ground. Since the adjournment of Congress, the ratifications of the treaty between the United States and Great Britain relative to coast fisheries and to reciprocal trade with the British North American provinces have been exchanged, and some of its anticipated advantages are already enjoyed by us although its full execution was to abide certain acts of legislation not yet fully performed. So soon as it was ratified, Great Britain opened to our commerce the free navigation of the river St. Lawrence, and to our fishermen unmolested access to the shores and bays from which they had been previously excluded on the coasts of her North American provinces, in return for which she asked for the introduction free of duty into the ports of the United States of the fish caught on the same coast by British fishermen. This being the compensation stipulated in the treaty for privileges of the highest importance and value to the United States, which were thus voluntarily yielded before it became effective, the request seemed to me to be a reasonable one, but it could not be acceded to from want of authority to suspend our laws imposing duties upon all foreign fish. In the meantime, the Treasury Department issued a regulation for ascertaining the duties paid or secured by bonds on fish caught on the coasts of the British provinces and brought to our markets by British subjects after the fishing grounds had been made fully accessible to the citizens of the United States. I recommend to your favorable consideration a proposition which will be submitted to you for authority to refund the duties and cancel the bonds thus received. The provinces of Canada and New Brunswick have also anticipated the full operation of the treaty by legislative arrangements, respectively to admit free of duty the products of the United States mentioned in the free list of the treaty, and an arrangement similar to that regarding British fish has been made for duties now chargeable on the products of those provinces enumerated in the same free list and introduced therefrom into the United States, a proposition for refunding which will in my judgment, be in like manner entitled to your favorable consideration. There is a difference of opinion between the United States and Great Britain as to the boundary line of the territory of Washington adjoining the British possessions on the Pacific, which has already led to difficulties on the part of the citizens and local authorities of the two governments. I recommend that provision he made for a commission to be joined by one on the part of Her Britannic Majesty for the purpose of running and establishing the line and controversy. 
certain stipulations of the third and fourth articles of the treaty concluded by the united states and great britain in 1846 regarding possessory rights of the hudson's bay company and property of the puget sound agricultural company have given rise to serious disputes and it is important to all concerned that summary means of settling them amicably should be devised i have reason to believe that an arrangement can be made on just terms for the extinguishment of the rights in question embracing also the right of the hudson's bay company to the navigation of the river columbia and i therefore suggest to your consideration the expediency of making a contingent appropriation for that purpose france was the early and efficient ally of the united states in their struggle for independence from that time to the present with occasional slight interruptions cordial relations of friendship have existed between the governments and people of the two countries the kindly sentiments cherished alike by both nations have led to extensive social and commercial intercourse which i trust will not be interrupted or checked by any casual event of an apparently unsatisfactory character the french consul at san francisco was not long since brought into the united states district court at that place by compulsory process as a witness in favor of another foreign consul in violation as the french government conceives of his privilege under our consular convention with france there being nothing in the transaction which could imply any disrespect to france or its consul such explanation has been made as i hope will be satisfactory subsequently misunderstanding arose on the subject of the french government having as it appeared abruptly excluded the american minister to spain from passing through france on his way from london to madrid but that government has unequivocally disavowed any design to deny the right of transit to the minister of the united states and after explanations to this effect he has resumed his journey and actually returned through france to spain i herewith lay before congress the correspondence on this subject between our envoy at paris and the minister of foreign relations of the french government the position of our affairs with spain remains as at close of the last session internal agitation assuming very nearly the character of political revolution has recently convulsed that country the late ministers were violently expelled from power and men of very different views in relation to its internal affairs have succeeded since this change there has been no propitious opportunity to resume and press on negotiations for the adjustment of serious questions of difficulty between the spanish government and the united states there is reason to believe that our minister will find the present government more favorably inclined than the preceding to comply with our just demands and to make suitable arrangements for restoring harmony and preserving peace between the two countries negotiations are pending with denmark to discontinue the practice of levying tolls on our vessels and their cargoes passing through the sound i do not doubt that we can claim exemption therefrom as a matter of right it is admitted on all hands that this exaction is sanctioned not by the general principles of the law of nations but only by special conventions which most of the commercial nations have entered into with denmark the fifth article of our treaty of eighteen twenty six with denmark provides that there shall not be paid on the vessels of the united states and their cargoes when passing through the sound higher duties than those of the most favored nations this may be regarded as an implied agreement to submit to the tolls during the continuance of the treaty and consequently may embarrass the assertion of our right to be released therefrom there are also other provisions in the treaty which ought to be modified it was to remain in force for ten years and until one year after either party should give notice to the other of intention to terminate it i deem it expedient that the contemplated notice should be given to the government of denmark the naval expedition dispatched about two years since for the purpose of establishing relations with the empire of japan has been ably and skillfully conducted to a successful termination by the officer to whom it was entrusted a treaty opening certain of the ports of that populous country has been negotiated and in order to give full effect thereto it only remains to exchange ratifications and adopt requisite commercial regulations the treaty lately concluded between the united states and mexico settled some of our most embarrassing difficulties with that country but numerous claims upon it for wrongs and injuries to our citizens remain unadjusted and many new cases have been recently added to the former list of grievances our legation has been earnest in its endeavors to obtain from the mexican government a favorable consideration of these claims but hitherto without success 
This failure is probably in some measure to be ascribed to the disturbed condition of that country. It has been my anxious desire to maintain friendly relations with the Mexican Republic and to cause its rights and territories to be respected not only by our citizens but by foreigners who have resorted to the United States for the purpose of organizing hostile expeditions against some of the states of that republic. The defenseless condition on which its frontiers have been left has stimulated lawless adventurers to embark in these enterprises and greatly increased the difficulty of enforcing our obligations of neutrality. Regarding it as my solemn duty to fulfill efficiently these obligations, not only toward Mexico, but other foreign nations, I have exerted all the powers with which I am invested to defeat such proceedings and bring to punishment those who by taking part therein violated our laws. The energy and activity of our civil and military authorities have frustrated the designs of those who meditated expeditions of this character except in two instances. One of these, composed of foreigners, was at first countenanced and aided by the Mexican government itself, it having been deceived as to their real object. The other, small in number, eluded the vigilance of the magistrates at San Francisco and succeeded in reaching the Mexican territories. But the effective measures taken by this government compelled the abandonment of the undertaking. The commission to establish the new line between the United States and Mexico, according to the provisions of the Treaty of the 30th of December last, has been organized and the work is already commenced. Our treaties with the Argentine Confederation and with the Republics of Uruguay and Paraguay secure to us the free navigation of the River La Plata and some of its larger tributaries, but the same success has not been attended our endeavors to open the Amazon. The reasons in favor of the free use of that river I had occasion to present fully in a former message, and, considering the cordial relations which have long existed between this government and Brazil, it may be expected that pending negotiations will eventually reach a favorable result. Convenient means of transit between the several parts of a country are not only desirable for the objects of commercial and personal communication, but essential to its existence under one government. Separated, as are the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of the United States, by the whole breadth of the continent, still the inhabitants of each are closely bound together by community of origin and institutions and by strong attachment to the Union. Hence the constant and increasing intercourse and vast interchange of commercial productions between these remote divisions of the Republic. At the present time, the most practicable and only commodious routes for communication between them are by way of the Isthmus of Central America. It is the duty of the government to secure these avenues against all danger of interruption. In relation to Central America, perplexing questions existed between the United States and Great Britain at the time of the cession of California. These, as well as questions which subsequently arose concerning interoceanic communication across the Isthmus, were, as it was supposed, adjusted by the treaty of april nineteen eighteen fifty but unfortunately they have been reopened by serious misunderstanding as to the import of some of its provisions a readjustment of which is now under consideration our minister at london has made strenuous efforts to accomplish this desirable object but has not yet found it possible to bring the negotiations to a termination as incidental to these questions i deem it proper to notice an occurrence which happened in central america near the close of the last session of Congress. So soon as the necessity was perceived of establishing interoceanic communications across the Isthmus, a company was organized, under the authority of the state of Nicaragua, but composed for the most part of citizens of the United States, for the purpose of opening such a transit way by the River San Juan and Lake Nicaragua, which soon became an eligible and much used route in the transportation of our citizens and their property between the Atlantic and Pacific. Meanwhile, and in anticipation of the completion and importance of this transit way, a number of adventurers had taken possession of the old Spanish port at the mouth of the River San Juan in open defiance of the state or states of Central America, which upon their becoming independent had rightfully succeeded to the local sovereignty and jurisdiction of Spain. These adventurers undertook to change the name of the place from San Juan del Norte to Greytown, and though at first pretending to act as the subjects of the fictitious sovereign of the Mosquito Indians, they subsequently repudiated the control of any power whatever, assumed to adopt a distinct political organization, and declared themselves an independent sovereign state. 
if at some time a faint hope was entertained that they might become a stable and respectable community that hope soon vanished they proceeded to assert unfounded claims to civil jurisdiction over punta arenas a position on the opposite side of the river san juan which was in possession under a title wholly independent of them of citizens of the united states interested in the nicaragua transit company and which was indispensably necessary to the prosperous operation of that route across the isthmus the company resisted their groundless claims whereupon they proceeded to destroy some of its buildings and attempted violently to dispossess it at a later period they organized a strong force for the purpose of demolishing the establishment at punta arenas but this mischievous design was defeated by the interposition of one of our ships of war at that time in the harbor of san juan subsequently to this in may last a body of men from graytown crossed over to punta arenas arrogating authority to arrest on the charge of murder a captain of one of the steamboats of the transit company being well aware that the claim to exercise jurisdiction there would be resisted then as it had been on previous occasions they went prepared to assert it by force of arms our minister to central america happened to be present on that occasion believing that the captain of the steamboat was innocent for he witnessed the transaction on which the charge was founded and believing also that the intruding party having no jurisdiction over the place where they proposed to make the arrest would encounter desperate resistance if they persisted in their purpose he interposed effectually to prevent violence and bloodshed the american minister afterwards visited graytown and whilst he was there a mob including certain of the so-called public functionaries of the place surrounded the house in which he was avowing that they had come to arrest him by order of some person exercising the chief authority while parleying with him he was wounded by a missile from the crowd a boat dispatched from the american steamer northern light to release him from the perilous situation in which he was understood to be was fired into by the town guard and compelled to return these incidents together with the known character of the population of graytown and their excited state induced just apprehensions that the lives and property of our citizens at punta arenas would be in imminent danger after the departure of the steamer with her passengers for new york unless a guard was left for their protection for this purpose and in order to ensure the safety of passengers and property passing over the route a temporary force was organized at considerable expense to the united states for which provision was made at the last session of congress this pretended community a heterogeneous assemblage gathered from various countries and composed for the most part of blacks and persons of mixed blood had previously given other indications of mischievous and dangerous propensities early in the same month property was clandestinely abstracted from the depot of the transit company and taken to graytown the plunderers obtained shelter there and their pursuers were driven back by its people who not only protected the wrongdoers and shared the plunder but treated with rudeness and violence those who sought to recover their property such in substance are the facts submitted to my consideration and proved by trustworthy evidence i could not doubt that the case demanded the interposition of this government justice required that reparation should be made for so many and such gross wrongs and that a course of insolence and plunder tending directly to the insecurity of the lives of numerous travelers and of the rich treasure belonging to our citizens passing over this transit way should be peremptorily arrested whatever it might be in other respects the community in question in power to do mischief was not despicable it was well provided with ordnance small arms and ammunition and might easily seize on the unarmed boats freighted with millions of property which passed almost daily within its reach it did not profess to belong to any regular government and had in fact no recognized dependence on or connection with any one to which the united states or their injured citizens might apply for redress or which could be held responsible in any way for the outrages committed not standing before the world in the attitude of an organized political society being neither competent to exercise their rights nor to discharge the obligations of a government it was in fact a marauding establishment too dangerous to be disregarded and too guilty to pass unpunished and yet incapable of being treated in any other way than as a piratical resort of outlaws or a camp of savages depredating on immigrant trains or caravans in the frontier settlements of civilized states seasonable notice was given to the people of graytown that this government required them to repair the injuries they had done to our citizens and to make suitable apology for their insult to our minister 
and that a ship of war would be dispatched thither to enforce compliance with these demands. But the notice passed unheeded. Thereupon a commander of the navy, in charge of the sloop of war Cyane, was ordered to repeat the demands and to insist upon a compliance therewith. Finding that neither the populace nor those assuming to have any authority over them manifested any disposition to make the required reparation, or even to offer excuse for their conduct, he warned them by a public proclamation that if they did not give satisfaction within a time specified, he would bombard the town. By this procedure he afforded them opportunity to provide for their personal safety. To those also who desired to avoid loss of property in the punishment about to be inflicted on the offending town, he furnished the means of removing their effects by the boats of his own ship and of a steamer which he procured and tendered to them for that purpose. At length, perceiving no disposition on the part of the town to comply with his requisitions, he appealed to the commander of Her Britannic Majesty's schooner Bermuda, who was seen to have intercourse and apparently much influence with the leaders among them, to interpose and persuade them to take some course calculated to save the necessity of resorting to the extreme measure indicated in his proclamation. But that officer, instead of acceding to the request, did nothing more than to protest against the contemplated bombardment. No steps of any sort were taken by the people to give the satisfaction required. No individuals, if any there were, who regarded themselves as not responsible for the misconduct of the community, adopted any means to separate themselves from the fate of the guilty. The several charges on which the demands for redress were founded had been publicly known to all for some time, and were again announced to them. They did not deny any of these charges. They offered no explanation, nothing in extenuation of their conduct, but contumaciously refused to hold any intercourse with the commander of the Cyane. By their obstinate silence, they seemed rather desirous to provoke chastisement than to escape it. There is ample reason to believe that this conduct of wanton defiance on their part was imputable chiefly to the delusive idea that the American government would be deterred from punishing them through fear of displeasing a formidable foreign power, which they presumed to think looked with complacency upon their aggressive and insulting deportment toward the United States. The Cyane at length fired upon the town. Before much injury had been done, the fire was twice suspended in order to afford opportunity for an arrangement, but this was declined. Most of the buildings of the place, of little value generally, were in the sequel destroyed, but, owing to the considerate precautions taken by our naval commander, there was no destruction of life. When the Cyane was ordered to Central America, it was confidently hoped and expected that no occasion would arise for a resort to violence and destruction of property and loss of life. Instructions to that effect were given to her commander, and no extreme act would have been requisite had not the people themselves, by their extraordinary conduct in the affair, frustrated all the possible mild measures for obtaining satisfaction. A withdrawal from the place, the object of his visit entirely defeated, would, under the circumstances in which the commander of the Cyane found himself, have been absolute abandonment of all claim of our citizens for indemnification and submissive acquiescence in national dignity. It would have encouraged in these lawless men a spirit of insolence and rapine most dangerous to the lives and property of our citizens at Punta Arenas, and probably emboldened them to grasp at the treasures and valuable merchandise continually passing over the Nicaragua route. It certainly would have been most satisfactory to me if the objects of the Siennese mission could have been consummated without any act of public force, but the arrogant contumacy of the offenders rendered it impossible to avoid the alternative either to break up their establishment or to leave them impressed with the idea that they might persevere with impunity in a career of insolence and plunder. This transaction has been the subject of complaint on the part of some foreign powers and has been characterized with more of harshness than of justice. If comparisons were to be instituted, it would not be difficult to present repeated instances in the history of states standing in the very front of modern civilization, where communities far less offending and more defenseless than Greytown have been chastised with much greater severity, and where not cities only have been laid in ruins, but human life has been recklessly sacrificed, and the blood of the innocent made profusely to mingle with that of the guilty. End of section 11. Recording by Mark Ernest. Section 12 of State of the Union Addresses. 
1849 to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Ernest. State of the Union Address. President Franklin Pierce. December 4, 1854. Part 2. Passing from foreign to domestic affairs, your attention is naturally directed to the financial condition of the country, always a subject of general interest. For complete and exact information regarding the finances and the various branches of the public service connected therewith, I refer you to the report of the Secretary of the Treasury, from which it will appear that the amount of revenue during the last fiscal year from all sources was seventy-three million five hundred forty-nine thousand seven hundred five and that the public expenditures for the same period exclusive of payments on account of the public debt amounted to fifty one million eighteen thousand two hundred forty nine during the same period the payments made in redemption of the public debt including interest and premium amounted to twenty four million three hundred thirty six thousand three hundred eighty to the sum total of the receipts of that year is to be added a balance remaining in the treasury at the commencement thereof amounting to twenty one million nine hundred forty two thousand eight hundred ninety two and at the close of the same year a corresponding balance amounting to twenty million one hundred thirty seven thousand nine hundred sixty seven of receipts above expenditures also remained in the treasury although in the opinion of the secretary of the treasury the receipts of the current fiscal year are not likely to equal in amount those of the last yet they will undoubtedly exceed the amount of expenditures by at least fifteen million i shall therefore continue to direct that the surplus revenue be applied so far as it can be judiciously and economically done to the reduction of the public debt the amount of which at the commencement of the last fiscal year was sixty seven million three hundred forty thousand six hundred twenty eight of which there had been paid on the twentieth day of november eighteen fifty four the sum of twenty two million three hundred sixty five thousand one hundred seventy two leaving a balance of outstanding public debt of only forty four million nine hundred seventy five thousand four hundred fifty six redeemable at different periods within fourteen years there are also remnants of other government stocks most of which are already due and on which the interest has ceased but which have not yet been presented for payment amounting to two hundred thirty three thousand one hundred seventy nine this statement exhibits the fact that the annual income of the government greatly exceeds the amount of its public debt which latter remains unpaid only because the time of payment has not yet matured and it cannot be discharged at once except at the option of public creditors who prefer to retain the securities of the united states and the other fact not less striking that the annual revenue from all sources exceeds by many millions of dollars the amount needed for a prudent and economical administration of the government the estimates presented to congress from the different executive departments at the last session amounted to thirty eight million four hundred six thousand five hundred eighty one and the appropriations made to the sum of fifty eight million one hundred sixteen thousand nine hundred fifty eight of this excess of appropriations over estimates however more than twenty millions was applicable to extraordinary objects having no reference to the usual annual expenditures among these objects was embraced ten millions to meet the third article of the treaty between the united states and mexico so that in fact for objects of ordinary expenditure the appropriations were limited to considerably less than forty million i therefore renew my recommendation for a reduction of the duties on imports the report of the secretary of the treasury presents a series of tables showing the operation of the revenue system for several successive years and as the general principle of reduction of duties with a view to revenue and not protection may now be regarded as the settled policy of the country i trust that little difficulty will be encountered in settling the details of a measure to that effect in connection with this subject i recommend a change in the laws which recent experience has shown to be essential to the protection of the government 
There is no express provision of law requiring the records and papers of a public character of the several officers of the government to be left in their offices for the use of their successors, nor any provision declaring it felony on their part to make false entries in the books or return false accounts. In the absence of such express provision by law, the outgoing officers in many instances have claimed and exercised the right to take into their own possession important books and papers, on the ground that these were their private property, and have placed them beyond the reach of the government. Conduct of this character, brought in several instances to the notice of the present Secretary of the Treasury, naturally awakened his suspicion, and resulted in the disclosure that at four ports, namely Oswego, Toledo, Sandusky, and Milwaukee, the Treasury had, by false entries, been defrauded within the four years next preceding March, 1853, of the sum of 198,000. The great difficulty with which the detection of these frauds has been attended, in consequence of the abstraction of books and papers by the retiring officers, and the facility with which similar frauds in the public service may be perpetrated, render the necessity of new legal enactments in the respects above referred to quite obvious. For other material modifications of the revenue laws which seem to me desirable, I refer you to the report of the Secretary of the Treasury. That report and the tables which accompany it furnish ample proofs of the solid foundation on which the financial security of the country rests and of the salutary influence of the independent treasury system upon commerce and all monetary operations. The experience of the last year furnishes additional reasons, I regret to say, of a painful character, for the recommendation heretofore made to provide for increasing the military force employed in the territory inhabited by the Indians. The settlers on the frontier have suffered much from the incursions of predatory bands, and large parties of immigrants to our Pacific possessions have been massacred with impunity. The recurrence of such scenes can only be prevented by teaching these wild tribes the power of and their responsibility to the United States. From the garrisons of our frontier posts, it is only possible to detach troops in small bodies, and though these have on all occasions displayed a gallantry and a stern devotion to duty which on a larger field would have commanded universal admiration, they have usually suffered severely in these conflicts with superior numbers, and have sometimes been entirely sacrificed. All the disposable force of the army is already employed on this service, and is known to be wholly inadequate to the protection which should be afforded. The public mind of the country has been recently shocked by savage atrocities committed upon defenseless immigrants and border settlements, and hardly less by the unnecessary destruction of valuable lives where inadequate detachments of troops have undertaken to furnish the needed aid. Without increase of the military force, these scenes will be repeated, it is to be feared, on a larger scale and with more disastrous consequences. Congress, I am sure, will perceive that the plainest duties and responsibilities of government are involved in this question, and I doubt not that prompt action may be confidently anticipated when delay must be attended by such fearful hazards. The bill of the last session providing for an increase of the pay of the rank and file of the Army has had beneficial results, not only in facilitating enlistments, but in obvious improvement in the class of men who enter the service. I regret that corresponding consideration was not bestowed on the officers who, in view of their character and services and the expenses to which they are necessarily subject, receive at present what is, in my judgment, inadequate compensation. The valuable services constantly rendered by the Army and its inestimable importance as the nucleus around which the volunteer forces of the nation can promptly gather in the hour of danger sufficiently attest the wisdom of maintaining a military peace establishment. But the theory of our system and the wise practice under it require that any proposed augmentation in time of peace be only commensurate with our extended limits and frontier relations. While scrupulously adhering to this principle, I find in existing circumstances a necessity for increase of our military force, and it is believed that for new regiments, two of infantry and two of mounted men, will be sufficient to meet the present exigency. If it were necessary carefully to weigh the cost in a case of such urgency, 
it would be shown that the additional expense would be comparatively light. With the increase of the numerical force of the Army should, I think, be combined certain measures of reform in its organic arrangement and administration. The present organization is the result of partial legislation often directed to special objects and interests, and the laws regulating rank and command, having been adopted many years ago from the British Code, are not always applicable to our service. It is not surprising, therefore, that the system should be deficient in the symmetry and simplicity essential to the harmonious working of its several parts and require a careful revision. The present organization, by maintaining large staff corps or departments, separates many officers from that close connection with troops and those active duties in the field which are deemed requisite to qualify them for the varied responsibilities of high command. Were the duties of the Army staff mainly discharged by officers detached from their regiments, it is believed that the special service would be equally well performed and the discipline and instruction of the Army be improved. While due regard to the security of the rights of officers and to the nice sense of honor which should be cultivated among them would seem to exact compliance with the established rule of promotion in ordinary cases, Still, it can hardly be doubted that the range of promotion by selection, which is now practically confined to the grade of general officers, might be somewhat extended with benefit to the public service. Observance of the rule of seniority sometimes leads, especially in time of peace, to the promotion of officers who, after meritorious and even distinguished service, may have been rendered by age or infirmity incapable of performing active duty, and whose advancement, therefore, would tend to impair the efficiency of the Army. Suitable provision for this class of officers, by the creation of a retired list, would remedy the evil without wounding the just pride of men who, by past services, have established a claim to high consideration." In again commending this measure to the favorable consideration of Congress, I would suggest that the power of placing officers on the retired list be limited to one year. The practical operation of the measure would thus be tested, and if after the lapse of years there should be occasion to renew the provision, it can be reproduced with any improvements which experience may indicate. The present organization of the artillery into regiments is liable to obvious objections. The service of artillery is that of batteries, and an organization of batteries into a corps of artillery would be more consistent with the nature of their duties. A large part of the troops now called artillery are, and have been, on duty as infantry, the distinction between the two arms being merely nominal. This nominal artillery in our service is disproportionate to the whole force and greater than the wants of the country demand. I therefore commend the discontinuance of a distinction which has no foundation in either the arms used or the character of the service expected to be performed. In connection with the proposition for the increase of the army, I have presented these suggestions with regard to certain measures of reform as the complement of a system which would produce the happiest results from a given expenditure and which, I hope, may attract the early attention and be deemed worthy of the approval of Congress. The recommendation of the Secretary of the Navy having reference to more ample provisions for the discipline and general improvement in the character of seamen and for the reorganization and gradual increase of the Navy, I deem eminently worthy of your favorable consideration. The principles which have controlled our policy in relation to the permanent military force by sea and land are sound, consistent with the theory of our system, and should by no means be disregarded, but limiting the force to the subjects particularly set forth in the preceding part of this message, we should not overlook the present magnitude and prospective extension of our commercial marine, nor fail to give due weight to the fact that besides the 2,000 miles of Atlantic seaboard we now have a Pacific coast stretching from Mexico to the British possessions in the north, teeming with wealth and enterprise and demanding the constant presence of ships of war. The augmentation of the Navy has not kept pace with the duties properly and profitably assigned to it in time of peace, and it is inadequate for the large field of its operations, not merely in the present but still more in the progressively increasing exigencies of the commerce of the United States. I cordially approve of the proposed apprentice system for our national vessels recommended by the Secretary of the Navy. 
the occurrence during the last few months of marine disasters of the most tragic nature involving great loss of human life has produced intense emotions of sympathy and sorrow throughout the country it may well be doubted whether all these calamitous events are wholly attributable to the necessary and inevitable dangers of the sea the merchants mariners and shipbuilders of the united states are it is true unsurpassed in far-reaching enterprise skill intelligence and courage by any others in the world but with the increasing amount of our commercial tonnage in the aggregate and the larger size and improved equipment of the ships now constructed a deficiency in the supply of reliable seamen begins to be very seriously felt the inconvenience may perhaps be met in part by due regulation for the introduction into our merchant ships of indented apprentices which while it would afford useful and eligible occupation to numerous young men would have a tendency to raise the character of seamen as a class and it is deserving of serious reflection whether it may not be desirable to revise the existing laws for the maintenance of discipline at sea upon which the security of life and property on the ocean must to so great an extent depend although much attention has already been given by congress to the proper construction and arrangement of steam vessels and all passenger ships still it is believed that the resources of science and mechanical skill in this direction have not been exhausted no good reason exists for the marked distinction which appears upon our statutes between the laws for protecting life and property at sea and those for protecting them on land in most of the states severe penalties are provided to punish conductors of trains engineers and others employed in the transportation of persons by railway or by steamboats on rivers why should not the same principle be applied to acts of insubordination cowardice or other misconduct on the part of masters and mariners producing injury or death to passengers on the high seas beyond the jurisdiction of any of the states and where such delinquencies can be reached only by the power of congress the whole subject is earnestly commended to your consideration the report of the postmaster general to which you are referred for many interesting details in relation to this important and rapidly extending branch of the public service shows that the expenditure of the year ending june thirty eighteen fifty four including one hundred thirty three thousand four hundred eighty three of balance due to foreign offices amounted to eight million seven hundred ten thousand nine hundred seven the gross receipts during the same period amounted to six million nine hundred fifty five thousand five hundred eighty six exhibiting an expenditure over income of one million seven hundred fifty five thousand three hundred twenty one and a diminution of deficiency as compared with the last year of three hundred sixty one thousand seven hundred fifty six the increase of the revenue of the department for the year ending june thirty eighteen fifty four over the preceding year was nine hundred seventy thousand three hundred ninety nine no proportionate increase however can be anticipated for the current year in consequence of the act of congress of june twenty three eighteen fifty four providing for increased compensation to all postmasters from these statements it is apparent that the post office department instead of defraying its expenses according to the design of the time of its creation is now and under existing laws must continue to be to no small extent a charge upon the general treasury the cost of mail transportation during the year ending june thirty eighteen fifty four exceeds the cost of the preceding year by four hundred ninety five thousand seventy four i again call your attention to the subject of mail transportation by ocean steamers and commend the suggestions of the postmaster general to your early attention during the last fiscal year eleven million seventy thousand nine hundred thirty five acres of the public lands have been surveyed and eight million one hundred ninety thousand seventeen acres brought into market the number of acres sold is seven million thirty five thousand seven hundred thirty five and the amount received therefore nine million two hundred eighty five thousand five hundred thirty three the aggregate amount of lands sold located under military scrip and land warrants selected as swamp lands by states and by locating under grants for roads is upward of twenty three million acres the increase of lands sold over the previous year is about six million acres and the sales during the first two quarters of the current year present the extraordinary result of five and a half millions sold 
exceeding by nearly four million acres the sales of the corresponding quarters of the last year. The commendable policy of the government in relation to setting apart public domain for those who have served their country in time of war is illustrated by the fact that since 1790 no less than 30 million acres have been applied to this object. The suggestions which I submitted in my annual message of last year in reference to grants of land in aid of the construction of railways were less full and explicit than the magnitude of the subject and subsequent developments would seem to render proper and desirable. Of the soundness of the principle then asserted with regard to the limitation of the power of Congress, I entertain no doubt. But in its application it is not enough that the value of lands in a particular locality may be enhanced that in fact a larger amount of money may probably be received in a given time for alternate sections than could have been realized for all the sections without the impulse and influence of the proposed improvements. A prudent proprietor looks beyond limited sections of his domain, beyond present results to the ultimate effect which a particular line of policy is likely to produce on all his possessions and interests. The government, which is trustee in this matter for the people of the states, is bound to take the same wise and comprehensive view. Prior to and during the last session of Congress, upward of 30 million acres of land were withdrawn from public sale with a view to applications for grants of this character pending before Congress. A careful review of the whole subject led me to direct that all such orders be abrogated and the lands restored to market, and instructions were immediately given to that effect. The applications at the last session contemplated the construction of more than 5,000 miles of road and grants to the amount of nearly 20 million acres of the public domain. Even admitting the right on the part of Congress to be unquestionable, is it quite clear that the proposed grants would be productive of good and not evil? The different projects are confined for the present to 11 states of this union and one territory. The reasons assigned for the grants show that it is proposed to put the works speedily in process of construction. When we reflect that since the commencement of the construction of railways in the United States, stimulated as they have been by the large dividends realized from the earlier works over the great thoroughfares and between the most important points of commerce and population encouraged by state legislation and pressed forward by the amazing energy of private enterprise only seventeen thousand miles have been completed in all the states in a quarter of a century when we see the crippled condition of many works commenced and prosecuted upon what were deemed to be sound principles and safe calculations, when we contemplate the enormous absorption of capital withdrawn from the ordinary channels of business, the extravagant rates of interest at this moment paid to continue operations, the bankruptcies, not merely in money but in character, and the inevitable effect upon finances generally, can it be doubted that the tendency is to run to excess in this matter? Is it wise to augment this excess by encouraging hopes of sudden wealth expected to flow from magnificent schemes dependent upon the action of Congress? Does the spirit which has produced such results need to be stimulated or checked? Is it not the better rule to leave all these works to private enterprise, regulated and, when expedient, aided by the cooperation of states? If constructed by private capital, the stimulant and the check go together and furnish a salutary restraint against speculative schemes and extravagance. But it is manifest that with the most effective guards, there is danger of going too fast and too far. We may well pause before a proposition contemplating a simultaneous movement for the construction of railroads, which in extent will equal exclusive of the great Pacific Road and all its branches, nearly one-third of the entire length of such works now completed in the United States and which cannot cost, with equipments, less than $150 million. The dangers likely to result from combinations of interests of this character can hardly be overestimated. But independently of these considerations, where is the accurate knowledge, the comprehensive intelligence, which shall discriminate between the relative claims of these 28 proposed roads in 11 states and one territory? Where will you begin and where end? If to enable these companies to execute their proposed works it is necessary that the aid of the general government be primarily given, 
the policy will present a problem so comprehensive in its bearings and so important to our political and social well-being as to claim in anticipation the severest analysis. Entertaining these views, I recur with satisfaction to the experience and action of the last session of Congress as furnishing assurance that the subject will not fail to elicit a careful re-examination and rigid scrutiny. It was my intention to present on this occasion some suggestions regarding internal improvements by the general government, which want of time at the close of the last session prevented my submitting on their return to the House of Representatives with objections of the bill entitled an act making appropriations for the repair, preservation, and completion of certain public works heretofore commenced under the authority of law. But the space in this communication, already occupied with other matter of immediate public exigency, constrains me to reserve that subject for a special message, which will be transmitted to the two Houses of Congress at an early day. The judicial establishment of the United States requires modification, and certain reforms in the manner of conducting the legal business of the government are also much needed. But as I have addressed you upon both of these subjects at length before, I have only to call your attention to the suggestions then made. My former recommendations in relation to suitable provision for various objects of deep interest to the inhabitants of the districts of Columbia are renewed. Many of these objects partake largely of a national character and are important independently of their relation to the prosperity of the only considerable organized community in the Union entirely unrepresented in Congress. I have thus presented suggestions on such subjects as appear to me to be of particular interest or importance, and therefore most worthy of consideration during the short remaining period allotted to the labors of the present Congress. Our forefathers of the thirteen United Colonies, in acquiring their independence and in rounding this Republic of the United States of America, have devolved upon us, their descendants, the greatest and the most noble trust ever committed to the hands of men, imposing upon all, and especially such as the public will may have invested for the time being with political functions, the most sacred obligations. We have to maintain inviolate the great doctrine of the inherent right of popular self-government, to reconcile the largest liberty of the individual citizen with complete security of the public order, to render cheerful obedience to the laws of the land, to unite in enforcing their execution, and to frown indignantly on all combinations to resist them, to harmonize a sincere and ardent devotion to the institutions of religious faith with the most universal religious toleration, to preserve the rights of all by causing each to respect those of the other, to carry forward every social improvement to the uttermost limit of human perfectibility by the free action of mind upon mind, not by the obtrusive intervention of misapplied force, to uphold the integrity and guard the limitations of our organic law, to preserve sacred from all touch of usurpation as the very palladium of our political salvation, the reserved rights and powers of the several states and of the people to cherish with loyal fealty and devoted affection this union as the only sure foundation on which the hopes of civil liberty rest to administer government with vigilant integrity and rigid economy to cultivate peace and friendship with foreign nations and to demand and exact equal justice from them all but to do wrong to none to eschew intermeddling with the national policy and the domestic repose of other governments, and to repel it from our own, never to shrink from war when the rights and the honor of the country call us to arms, but to cultivate in preference the arts of peace, seek enlargement of the rights of neutrality, and elevate and liberalize the intercourse of nations, and by such just and honorable means, and such only, whilst exalting the condition of the republic, to assure to it the legitimate influence and the benign authority of a great example amongst all the powers of Christendom. Under the solemnity of these convictions, the blessing of Almighty God is earnestly invoked to attend upon your deliberations and upon all the counsels and acts of the government, to the end that, with common zeal and common efforts, we may, in humble submission to the divine will, Cooperate for the promotion of the supreme good of these United States. End of section twelve. Recording by Mark Ernest.
Section 13 of State of the Union Addresses, 1849 to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. State of the Union Address, Franklin Pierce, December 31, 1855, Part 1. Fellow citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, the Constitution of the United States provides that Congress shall assemble annually on the first Monday of December, and it has been usual for the President to make no communication of a public character to the Senate and House of Representatives until advised of their readiness to receive it. I have deferred to this usage until the close of the first month of the session, but my convictions of duty will not permit me longer to postpone the discharge of the obligation enjoined by the Constitution upon the President. Quote, to give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. End quote. It is matter of congratulation that the Republic is tranquilly advancing in a career of prosperity and peace. Whilst relations of amity continue to exist between the United States and all foreign powers, with some of them grave questions are depending which may require the consideration of Congress. Of such questions, the most important is that which has arisen out of the negotiations with Great Britain in reference to Central America. By the convention concluded between the two governments on the 19th of April, 1850, both parties coveted that, quote, neither will ever occupy or fortify or colonize or assume or exercise any dominion over Nicaragua, Costa Rica, the Mosquito Coast, or any part of Central America. End quote. It was the undoubted understanding of the United States in making this treaty that all the present states of the former Republic of Central America and the entire territory of each would thenceforth enjoy complete independence, and that both contracting parties engaged equally and to the same extent, for the present and for the future, that if either then had any claim of right in Central America, such claim and all occupation or authority under it were unreservedly relinquished by the stipulations of the convention and that no dominion was thereafter to be exercised or assumed in any part of central america by great britain or the united states this government consented to restrictions in regard to a region of country wherein we had specific and peculiar interests only upon the conviction that the like restrictions were in the same sense obligatory on great britain but for this understanding of the force and effect of the convention it would never have been concluded by us so clear was this understanding on the part of the united states that in correspondence contemporaneous with the ratification of the convention it was distinctly expressed that the mutual covenants of non-occupation were not intended to apply to the british establishment at the belize this qualification is to be ascribed to the fact that in virtue of successive treaties with previous sovereigns of the country great britain had obtained a concession of the right to cut mahogany or dye woods at the belize but with positive exclusion of all domain or sovereignty and thus it confirms the natural construction and understood import of the treaty as to all the rest of the region to which the stipulations applied it however became apparent at an early day after entering upon the discharge of my present functions that great britain still continued in the exercise or assertion of large authority in all that part of central america commonly called the mosquito coast and covering the entire length of the state of nicaragua and a part of costa rica that she regarded the belize as her absolute domain and was gradually extending its limits at the expense of the state of honduras and that she had formerly colonized a considerable insular group known as the bay islands and belonging of right to that state all these acts of pretensions of great britain being contrary to the rights of the states of central america and to the manifest tenor of her stipulations with the united states as understood by this government have been made the subject of negotiation through the american minister in london I transmit herewith the instructions to him on the subject and the correspondence between him and the British Secretary for Foreign Affairs, by which you will perceive that the two governments differ widely and irreconcilably 
as to the construction of the convention and its effect on their respective relations to central america great britain so construes the convention as to maintain unchanged all her previous pretensions over the mosquito coast and in different parts of central america these pretensions as to the mosquito coast are founded on the assumption of political relation between great britain and the remnant of a tribe of indians on that coast entered into at a time when the whole country was a colonial possession of spain it cannot be successively controverted that by the public law of europe and america no possible act of such indians or their predecessors could confer on great britain any political rights great britain does not allege the assent of spain as the origin of her claims on the mosquito coast she has on the contrary by repeated and successive treaties renounced and relinquished all pretensions of her own and recognized the full and sovereign rights of spain in the most unequivocal terms yet these pretensions so without solid foundation in the beginning and thus repeatedly abjured were at a recent period revived by great britain against the central american states the legitimate successors to all the ancient jurisdiction of spain in that region they were first applied only to a defined part of the coast of nicaragua afterwards to the whole of its atlantic coast and lastly to a part of the coast of costa rica and they are now reasserted to this extent notwithstanding engagements to the united states on the eastern coast of nicaragua and costa rica the interference of great britain though exerted at one time in the form of military occupation of the port of san juan del norte then in the peaceful possession of the appropriate authorities of the central american states is now presented by her as the rightful exercise of a protectorateship over the mosquito tribe of indians but the establishment at the balize now reaching far beyond its treaty limits into the state of honduras and that of the bay islands appertaining of right to the same state are as distinctly colonial governments as those of jamaica or canada and therefore contrary to the very letter as well as the spirit of the convention with the united states as it was at the time of ratification and now is understood by this government the interpretation which the british government thus in assertion and act persists in ascribing to the convention entirely changes its character while it holds us to all our obligations it in a great measure releases great britain from those which constituted the consideration of this government for entering into the convention it is impossible in my judgment for the united states to acquiesce in such a construction of the respective relations of the two governments to central america to a renewed call by this government upon great britain to abide by and carry into effect the stipulations of the convention according to its obvious import by withdrawing from the possession or colonization of portions of the central american states of honduras nicaragua and costa rica the british government has at length replied affirming that the operation of the treaty is prospective only and did not require great britain to abandon or contract any possessions held by her in central america at the date of its conclusion this reply substitutes a partial issue in the place of the general one presented by the united states the british government passes over the question of the rights of great britain real or supposed in central america and assumes that she had such rights at the date of the treaty and that those rights comprehended the protectorship of the mosquito indians the extended jurisdiction and limits of the balize and the colony of the bay islands and therefore proceeds by implication to infer that if the stipulations of the treaty be merely future in effect great britain may still continue to hold the contested portions of central america the united states cannot admit either the inference or the premises we steadily deny that at the date of the treaty great britain had any possessions there other than the limited and peculiar establishment at the belize and maintain that if she had any they were surrendered by the convention this government recognizing the obligations of the treaty has of course desired to see it executed in good faith by both parties and in a discussion therefore has not looked to rights which we might assert independently of the treaty in consideration of our geographical position and of other circumstances which create for us relations to the central american states different from those of any government of europe the british government in its last communication although well knowing the views of the united states 
still declares that it sees no reason why a conciliatory spirit may not enable the two governments to overcome all obstacles to a satisfactory adjustment of the subject assured of the correctness of the construction of the treaty constantly adhered to by this government and resolved to insist on the rights of the united states yet actuated also by the same desire which is avowed by the british government to remove all causes of serious misunderstanding between two nations associated by so many ties of interest and kindred it has appeared to me proper not to consider an amicable solution of the controversy hopeless there is however reason to apprehend that with great britain in the actual occupation of the disputed territories and the treaty therefore practically null so far as regards our rights this international difficulty cannot long remain undetermined without involving in serious danger the friendly relations which it is the interest as well as the duty of both countries to cherish and preserve it will afford me sincere gratification if future efforts shall result in the success anticipated heretofore with more confidence than the aspect of the case permits me now to entertain one other subject of discussion between the united states and great britain has grown out of the attempt which the exigencies of the war in which she is engaged with russia induced her to make to draw recruits from the united states it is the traditional and subtle policy of the united states to maintain impartial neutrality during the wars which from time to time occur among the great powers of the world performing all the duties of neutrality toward the respective belligerent states we may reasonably expect them not to interfere with our lawful enjoyment of its benefits notwithstanding the existence of such hostilities our citizens retain the individual right to continue all their accustomed pursuits by land or by sea at home or abroad subject only to such restrictions in this relation as the laws of war the usage of nations or special treaties may impose and it is our sovereign right that our territory and jurisdiction shall not be invaded by either of the belligerent parties for the transit of their armies the operation of their fleets the levy of troops for their service the fitting out of cruisers by or against either or any other act or incident of war and these undeniable rights of neutrality individual and national the united states will under no circumstances surrender in pursuance of this policy the laws of the united states do not forbid their citizens to sell to either of the belligerent powers articles contraband of war or take munitions of war or soldiers on board their private ships for transportation and although in doing so the individual citizen exposes his property or person to some of the hazards of war his acts do not involve any breach of national neutrality nor of themselves implicate the government thus during the progress of the present war in europe our citizens have without national responsibility therefore sold gunpowder and arms to all buyers regardless of the destination of those articles our merchantmen have been and still continue to be largely employed by great britain and by france in transporting troops provisions and munitions of war to the principal seat of military operations and in bringing home their sick and wounded soldiers but such use of our mercantile marine is not interdicted either by the international or by our municipal law and therefore does not compromise our neutral relations with russia but our municipal law in accordance with the law of nations preemptorily forbids not only foreigners but our own citizens to fit out within the united states a vessel to commit hostilities against any state with which the united states are at peace or to increase the force of any foreign armed vessel intended for such hostilities against a friendly state whatever concern may have been felt by either of the belligerent powers lest private armed cruisers or other vessels in the service of one might be fitted out in the ports of this country to depredate on the property of the other all such fears have proved to be utterly groundless our citizens have been withheld from any such act or purpose by good faith and by respect for the law while the laws of the union are thus preemptory in their prohibition of the equipment or armament of belligerent cruisers in our ports they provide not less absolutely that no person shall within the territory or jurisdiction of the united states enlist or enter himself or hire or retain another person to enlist or enter himself or to go beyond the limits or jurisdiction of the united states with intent to be enlisted or entered in the service of any foreign state 
either as a soldier or as a marine or seaman on board of any vessel of war letter of mark or privateer and these enactments are also in strict conformity with the law of nations which declares that no state has the right to raise troops for land or sea service in another state without its consent and that whether forbidden by the municipal law or not the very attempt to do it without such consent is an attack on the national sovereignty such being the public rights and the municipal law of the united states no solicitude on the subject was entertained by this government when a year since the british parliament passed an act to provide for the enlistment of foreigners in the military service of great britain nothing on the face of the act or in its public history indicated that the british government proposed to attempt recruitment in the united states nor did it ever give intimation of such intent to this government it was matter of surprise therefore to find subsequently that the engagement of persons within the united states to proceed to halifax and the british province of nova scotia and there enlist in the service of great britain was going on extensively with little or no disguise ordinary legal steps were immediately taken to arrest and punish parties concerned and so put an end to acts infringing the municipal law and derogatory to our sovereignty meanwhile suitable representations on the subject were addressed to the british government thereupon it became known by the admission of the british government itself that the attempt to draw recruits from this country originated with it or at least had its approval and sanction but it also appeared that the public agents engaged in it had quote, stringent instructions unquote, not to violate the municipal law of the united states it is difficult to understand how it should have been supposed that troops could be raised here by great britain without violation of the municipal law the unmistakable object of the law was to prevent every such act which if performed must be either in violation of the law or in studied evasion of it and in either alternative the act done would be alike injurious to the sovereignty of the united states in the meantime the matter acquired additional importance by the recruitments in the united states not being discontinued and the disclosure of the fact that they were prosecuted upon a systematic plan devised by official authority that recruiting rendezvous had been opened in our principal cities and depots for the reception of recruits established on our frontier and the whole business conducted under the supervision and by the regular cooperation of british officers civil and military some in the north american provinces and some in the united states the complicity of those officers in an undertaking which could only be accomplished by defying our laws throwing suspicion over our attitude of neutrality and disregarding our territorial rights is conclusively proved by the evidence elicited on the trial of such of their agents as have been apprehended and convicted some of the officers thus implicated are of high official position and many of them beyond our jurisdiction so that legal proceedings could not reach the source of the mischief these considerations and the fact that the cause of complaint was not a mere casual occurrence trot a deliberate design entered upon with full knowledge of our laws and national policy and conducted by responsible public functionaries impelled me to present the case to the british government in order to secure not only a cessation of the wrong but its reparation the subject is still under discussion the result of which will be communicated to you in due time i repeat the recommendation submitted to the last congress that provision be made for the appointment of a commissioner in connection with great britain to survey and establish the boundary line which divides the territory of washington from the contiguous british possessions by reason of the extent and importance of the country in dispute there has been imminent danger of collision between the subjects of great britain and the citizens of the united states including their respective authorities in that quarter the prospect of a speedy arrangement has contributed hitherto to induce on both sides forbearance to assert by force what each claims as a right continuance of delay on the part of the two governments to act in the matter will increase the dangers and difficulties of the controversy 
misunderstanding exists as to the extent character and value of the possessory rights of the hudson bay company and the property of the puget sound agricultural company reserved in our treaty with great britain relative to the territory of oregon i have reason to believe that a cession of the rights of both companies to the united states which would be the readiest means of terminating all questions can be obtained on reasonable terms and with a view to this i present the subject to the attention of congress the colony of newfoundland having enacted the laws required by the treaty of the fifth of june eighteen fifty four is now placed on the same footing in respect to commercial intercourse with the united states as the other british north american provinces the commission which that treaty contemplated for determining the rights of fishery in rivers and mouths of rivers on the coasts of the united states and the british north american provinces has been organized and has commenced its labors to complete which there are needed further appropriations for the service of another season in pursuance of the authority conferred by a resolution of the senate of the united states passed on the third of march last notice was given to denmark on the fourteenth of april of the intention of this government to avail itself of the stipulation of the subsisting convention of friendship commerce and navigation between that kingdom and the united states whereby either party might after ten years terminate the same at the expiration of one year from the date of notice for that purpose the considerations which led me to call the attention of congress to that convention and induce the senate to adopt the resolution referred to still continue in full force the convention contains an article which although it does not directly engage the united states to submit to the imposition of tolls on the vessels and cargoes of americans passing into or from the baltic sea during the continuance of the treaty yet may by possibility be construed as implying such submission the exaction of these tolls not being justified by any principle of international law it became the right and duty of the united states to relieve themselves from the implication of engagement on the subject so as to be perfectly free to act in the premises in such way as their public interests and honor shall demand i remain of the opinion that the united states ought not to submit to the payment of the sound dues not so much because of their amount which is a secondary matter but because it is in effect a recognition of the right of denmark to treat one of the great maritime highways of nations as a close sea and prevent the navigation of it as a privilege for which tribute may be imposed upon those who have occasions to use it this government on a former occasion not unlike the present signalized its determination to maintain the freedom of the seas and of the great natural channels of navigation the barbary states had for a long time coerced the payment of tribute from all nations whose ships frequented the mediterranean to the last demand of such payment made by them the united states although suffering less by their depredations than many other nations returned the explicit answer that we preferred war to tribute and thus opened the way to the relief of the commerce of the world from an ignominious tax so long submitted to by the more powerful nations of europe if the manner of payment of the sound dues differs from that of the tribute formerly conceded to the barbary states still their exaction by denmark has no better foundation in right each was in its origin nothing but a tax on a common natural right extorted by those who were at that time able to obstruct the free and secure enjoyment of it but who no longer possessed that power denmark while resisting our assertion of the freedom of the baltic sound and belts has indicated a readiness to make some new arrangement on the subject and has invited the governments interested including the united states to be represented in a convention to assemble for the purpose of receiving and considering a proposition which she intends to submit for the capitalization of the sound dues and the distribution of the sum to be paid as commutation among the governments according to the respective proportions of their maritime commerce to and from the baltic i have declined in behalf of the united states to accept this invitation for the most cogent reasons one is that denmark does not offer to submit to the convention the question of her right to levy the sound dues the second is that if the convention were allowed to take cognizance of that particular question still it would not be competent to deal with the great international principle involved 
which affects the right in other cases of navigation and commercial freedom as well as that of access to the baltic above all by the express terms of the proposition it is contemplated that the consideration of the sound due shall be commingled with and made subordinate to a matter wholly extraneous the balance of power among the governments of europe while however rejecting this proposition and insisting on the right of free transit into and from the baltic i have expressed to denmark a willingness on the part of the united states to share liberally with other powers in compensating her for any advantages which commerce shall hereafter derive from expenditures made by her for the improvement and safety of the navigation of the sound or belts i lay before you herewith sundry documents on the subject in which my views are more fully disclosed should no satisfactory arrangement be soon concluded i shall again call your attention to the subject with recommendation of such measures as may appear to be required in order to assert and secure the rights of the united states so far as they are affected by the pretensions of denmark i announce with much gratification that since the adjournment of the last congress the question then existing between this government and that of france respecting the french consul at san francisco has been satisfactorily determined and that the relations of the two governments continue to be of the most friendly nature a question also which has been pending for several years between the united states and the kingdom of greece growing out of the sequestration by public authorities of that country of property belonging to the present american consul at athens and which has been the subject of very earnest discussion heretofore has recently been settled to the satisfaction of the party interested and of both governments with spain peaceful relations are still maintained and some progress has been made in securing the redress of wrongs complained of by this government spain has not only disavowed and disapproved the conduct of the officers who illegally seized and detained the steamer black warrior at havana but has also paid the sum claimed as indemnity for the loss thereby inflicted on citizens of the united states in consequence of a destructive hurricane which visited cuba in eighteen forty four the supreme authority of that island issued a decree permitting the importation for the period of six months of certain building materials and provisions free of duty but revoked it when about half the period only had elapsed to the injury of citizens of the united states who had proceeded to act on the faith of that decree the spanish government refused indemnification to the parties aggrieved until recently when it was asserted to payment being promised to be made so soon as the amount due can be ascertained satisfaction claim for the arrest and search of the steamer el dorado has not yet been accorded but there is reason to believe that it will be and that case with others continues to be urged on the attention of the spanish government i do not abandon the hope of concluding with spain some general arrangement which if it do not wholly prevent the recurrence of difficulties in cuba will render them less frequent and whenever they shall occur facilitate their most speedy settlement the interposition of this government has been invoked by many of its citizens on account of injuries done to their persons and property for which the mexican government is responsible the unhappy situation of that country for some time past has not allowed its government to give due consideration to claims of private reparation and has appeared to call for and justify some forbearance in such matters on the part of this government but if the revolutionary movements which have lately occurred in that republic end in the organization of a stable government urgent appeals to its justice will then be made and it may be hoped with success for the redress of all complaints of our citizens in regard to the american republics which from their proximity and other consideration have peculiar relations to this government while it has been my constant aim strictly to observe all the obligations of political friendship and of good neighborhood obstacles to this have arisen in some of them from their own insufficient power to check lawless eruptions which in effect throws most of the task on the united states thus it is that the distracted internal condition of the state of nicaragua has made it incumbent on me to appeal to the good faith of our citizens to abstain from unlawful intervention in its affairs and to adopt preventive measures to the same end which on a similar occasion had the best results in reassuring the peace of the mexican states of sonora and lower california since the last session of congress a treaty of amity 
commerce and navigation and for the surrender of fugitive criminals for the kingdom of the two sicilies a treaty of friendship commerce and navigation with nicaragua and a convention of commercial reciprocity with the hawaiian kingdom have been negotiated the latter kingdom and the state of nicaragua have also acceded to a declaration recognizing as international rights the principles contained in the convention between the united states and russia of july twenty two eighteen fifty four these treaties and conventions will be laid before the senate for ratification the statements made in my last annual message respecting the anticipated receipts and expenditures of the treasury have been substantially verified it appears from the report of the secretary of the treasury that the receipts during the last fiscal year ending june thirtieth eighteen fifty five from all sources were sixty five million three thousand nine hundred and thirty dollars and that the public expenditures for the same period exclusive of payments on account of the public debt amounted to fifty six million three hundred sixty five thousand three hundred and ninety three dollars during the same period the payments made in redemption of the public debt including interest and premium amounted to nine million eight hundred forty four thousand five hundred and twenty eight dollars the balance in the treasury at the beginning of the present fiscal year july first eighteen fifty five was eighteen million nine hundred thirty one thousand nine hundred seventy six the receipts for the first quarter and the estimated receipts for the remaining three quarters amount together to sixty seven million nine hundred eighteen thousand seven hundred and thirty four dollars thus affording in all as the available resources of the current fiscal year the sum of eighty six million eight hundred fifty six thousand seven hundred and ten dollars if to the actual expenditures of the first quarter of the current fiscal year be added the probable expenditures for the remaining three quarters as estimated by the secretary of the treasury the sum total will be seventy one million two hundred twenty six thousand eight hundred and forty six dollars thereby leaving an estimated balance in the treasury on july one eighteen fifty six of fifteen million six hundred twenty three thousand eight hundred sixty three dollars and forty one cents in the above estimated expenditures of the present fiscal year are included three million dollars to meet the last installment of the ten millions provided for in the late treaty with mexico and seven million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars appropriated on account of the debt due to texas which two sums make an aggregate amount of ten million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and reduce the expenditures actual or estimated for ordinary objects of the year to the sum of sixty million four hundred seventy six thousand dollars the amount of the public debt at the commencement of the present fiscal year was forty million five hundred eighty three thousand six hundred and thirty one dollars and deduction being made of subsequent payments the whole public debt of the federal government remaining at this time is less than forty million dollars the remnant of certain other government stocks amounting to two hundred forty three thousand dollars referred to in my last message as outstanding has since been paid i am fully persuaded that it would be difficult to devise a system superior to that by which the fiscal business of the government is now conducted notwithstanding the great number of public agents of collection and disbursement it is believed that the checks and guards provided including the requirement of monthly returns render it scarcely possible for any considerable fraud on the part of those agents or neglect involving hazard of serious public loss to escape detection i renew however the recommendation heretofore made by me of the enactment of a law declaring it felony on the part of public officers to insert false entries in their books of record or account or to make false returns and also requiring them on the termination of their service to deliver to their successors all books records and other objects of a public nature in their custody derived as our public revenue is in chief part from duties on imports its magnitude affords gratifying evidence of the prosperity not only of our commerce but of the other great interests upon which that depends the principle that all monies not required for the current expenses of the government should remain for active employment in the hands of the people 
and the conspicuous fact that the annual revenue from all sources exceeds by many millions of dollars the amount needed for a prudent and economical administration of public affairs cannot fail to suggest the propriety of an early revision and reduction of the tariff of duties on imports it is now so generally conceded that the purpose of revenue alone can justify the imposition of duties on imports that in readjusting the impost tables and schedules which unquestionably require essential modifications a departure from the principles of the present tariff is not anticipated end of section thirteen recording by gary b clayton